President. Dave Lewis. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Can you all hear me okay? Okay, I won't bother a bit. I guess we have to, we have, to have a Okay, testing. Thank you. I just want to welcome all of you to the museum for this special presentation that that Mike has put together, and it's a tough tough act to follow us to follow Paul. Uh, he's a very revered and uh, important part of our museum, and uh, and we're always delighted to have Mary Lou show up and bless our uh, bless our gathering. Uh, just wanted to uh, tell you a little bit about the museum. To those of you who haven't been here before, we were founded in 2001 by five. Uh, uh, World War II veterans that didn't know what to do with all their stuff and their stories. And so they got together and they talked the city into donating this room, okay, as part of the maybe Dowd Eisenhower Museum, <laughs> a library. Okay, maybe it's a mouthful, isn't it? Anyway, so, and they gave us this room, and then over the years we were able to get the rest of the year, uh, the rest of the uh, top floor. We've also been awarded the bottom floor now that we're going to take over starting the first of the year when we get it redone. So eventually, maybe when, the, when you come back in a couple of years, a couple of months, we may be meeting downstairs with a whole new uh, uh, presentation room, which is going to be really, really neat. Uh, and by the way, uh, we tore a bunch of shelving down there. If anybody wants wood, to, uh, please take it today, because otherwise it's going to be tr it's going to be trashed. So. Uh, but we live on, uh, even though the city gives us this building, we live on donations. Uh, that's how we, we pay everything. Everybody here that you see in a red vest or a blue vest is a, don is a volunteer, and we live on donations. So whatever you can help us with, we always appreciate it. Uh, the other thing is membership. We're, we're, always, we're always trying to encourage new members to come join us. Uh, and there are some benefits for membership. You get uh, you get to come to our annual meetings, which is, by the way, is next weekend at uh, nine o'clock. We'd love to have y'all come, and uh, and then we uh, you know get to you know, get to borrow books out of the library and so on like that, and even come in and, and watch. Uh, we can, I guess we loan out these, don't we? The DVDs, yes, okay. Free donuts. And oh yeah, just don't forget the donuts and coffee. Yeah, and free parking, of course. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, I just wanted to uh, to welcome all of you. We'll get on with the presentation, but uh, Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays to all of you. Thank you. Thank you again, and thank you for joining us for our 139th Coffee and Conversation. And again, we think this is such a special occasion uh, to honor the men, women, and the families, certainly, of the USS Indianapolis, especially since you know, some months ago, uh, the wreckage of the Indianapolis was finally discovered. So what we'd like to do today is we're so thankful for Mary Lou and your family for joining us today. We'd like to have Mary Lou talk to us a little bit. I'll cover then just a short history of the Indianapolis because it did so much more than just carry the atomic bombs up. Then uh, we'll have a reception with a marvelous sheet cake in the library. And for those who've been interested, we do have the video. Oh, it is. <laughs> no, sorry. It isn't so much for us in here, it's for the other room, because we do have a, quite a few today. Uh, but anyway, without further ado, I'd like to have Mary Lou, if you could come up and talk to us a little. If you wouldn't mind just using this kind of here so we can record it. Oh. <clears throat> okay, I want to thank everybody today for coming. And I want to thank all of the board of the museum for uh, giving us a space for the USS Indianapolis, and also honoring Paul's memory today. <clears throat> I'd like to introduce my family that's here, Tammy, my favorite daughter. <laughs> that's her husband, Larry Brown. He, <laughs> and then my favorite granddaughter, Lauren, and her friend, Dave. And Dave uh, just proudly served eight years in the Marines. And then we have 
Paul's nephew and his wife, uh, John Murray and uh, John Murphy and uh, um, Mary. They're from Estes Park. They were going to try to bring Paul's brother Bill. Maybe many, many of you remember Bill and Sue Murphy lived here. And because of poor health, they're now in a home in Boulder. And uh, so anyway, let Bill know and Sue, we love him very much. Uh, now you've all heard the story of the Indianapolis. I've heard it many, many times. Paul used to tell that story at least once or twice a week at schools. I could tell you what the next sentence would be. It's kind of like the Eastern Christmas story. I often thought, maybe just today the ship won't sink. But the story never changed, always the same story. Now what I want to share with you today are some things you've never heard about the Indianapolis. I want to tell you how I met Paul and my part in this story for 35 years. I was working two jobs, secretary for the Denver schools, and I was working uh, manage a pizza hut right over here years ago, and I hired a lot of young kids. One of the young kids I had was um, Bill Murphy's, one of his sons, John's little brother, Gary. And Gary said, uh, Mary Lou, you need to meet my uncle. I said, oh, well, tell me about him. <clears throat> he said he's really a nice guy, and uh, he's divorced, and he's got um, five kids. He's an Irish Catholic, and smokes cigars, <laughs> and he buys Chevis by the gallon. <laughs> I said, oh, Gary, I don't think I'm interested. <laughs> but time went on, and it was St. Patrick's Day, and Bill and Sue called one morning and said, how about meeting us at breakfast over at Village Inn, which was over here on 287, which is now the barbecue place. <laughs> so I met them there, and this guy walked in with them, <laughs> and was he handsome. <laughs> I thought, wow. So he said, um, want to go out tonight? It was St. Patrick's Day. I said, no, I can't. I have to close at pizza. And he said, well, I'll be at this bar over here, Fiore's Bar over there that used to be by Go Go Liquors. He said, when you get off at midnight, come over. I said, oh, I don't do bars. And he said, well, just come over and have a Coke. Well, I didn't. I went home. But the next morning he called. And he said, um, you stood me up last night. I said, no, I told you I don't do bars. He said, well, how about dinner tonight? Well, we went out, and I was with him about an hour. And he told me this Indianapolis story. I thought, my God, what an imagination this man has. <laughs> Chavis by the gallon, smoke cigars, five kids. And now he tells me this? <coughs> well, about three weeks went by, and I saw him a lot, and I started to really like him. And so one night we were out, and I told him, I said, remember our first date, and you told me you were on this ship, and you delivered the bomb and all that? I said, was that really true? He said, it really was. So anyway, we went on, and I went to this first reunion with him. In those days, we had reunions just every five years. And he was um, elected vice chairman. And the next reunion, he was elected chairman, and I was elected secretary. Now you know, when you're secretary, who does all the work? <laughs> but that's OK. I told Paul, I said, listen, we've got three goals. If you're going to be chairman and I'm secretary, we're setting three goals. We're going to get a monument for Indianapolis, and we're going to get Captain McVeigh exonerated and we're going to write a book. Well, OK, so we started with the mayor in Indianapolis. Can you give us a spot for a monument? He said, uh, I'll, I'll check with city council, and I'll get back with you. About a month later, he called, and he said, we've got a spot for your monument. 
And uh, Paul said, well, what's the address? So he gave us the address, and we have a had a survivor that lived in Indianapolis, and he'd been a fireman for 40-some years, and everybody loved Jimmy. So Paul called Jimmy and said, hey, Jimmy, we've got a spot for the monument. He said, what's the address? Paul told him, and he said, oh, my God. He said, can't they do better than that? Well, I'll tell you what the spot was. It was about three miles from downtown Indianapolis on a filthy, dirty river. A couple old, dilapidated, uh, closed uh, warehouses and uh, weeds. And I'll tell you what it kind of reminded me of. If you can visualize the South Platte River down on around 72nd and Washington, kind of that area. A lot of homeless people. And so we were so disappointed, but the mayor insisted that's the best they could give us. So in those days, we had yellow pages. I got the yellow pages out to see if I could find an architect. I found three of them. <clears throat> first one said, when we told him the address, he said, oh, I, I wouldn't even go out there. But we met two other architects. And the one, he didn't think that was ever going to work. But the third one said, I think there's some good possibility here. OK, so he drew up a plan. and It was beautiful. $2 million. Well, how in the world do you raise $2 million for a monument? Well. Show some that um, we came back and we worked with um, Morgan Awards, and this is what I want to really okay stress to you: the business we did with two wonderful businesses right here in Broomfield. This is the monument in Indianapolis, and then on the back. <coughs> are the names of the men. That's about 25 feet long, if you can imagine. And they cleaned up the river. Absolutely beautiful monument. The Chamber of Commerce tells us when people come to Indianapolis, that's the monument they want to see. There are uh, only Washington, D.C. has more monuments than Indianapolis. But we had to raise $2 million. So how do you start raising $2 million? Well, we found some wealthy people in Indianapolis. And then we started selling merchandise, again, thanks to Morgan Awards over here. I just want a few things just to give you an idea what we sold to raise $2 million. We had caps. And I'll guarantee you, everything we made in USA. Here's <laughs> some more of our t-shirts. And I'll tell you, we sold thousands of these t-shirts. And not only did we make good money, but it was wonderful advertising. Here's another one of the t-shirts. Has the names on the back. Tote bags. You name it. We, we sold stuff. Um, yeah, even Mouth Christmas hats. ornaments. Jackets. What? Oh. We all just brainstorm. What can what else can we get? Chip clips. <laughs> <laughs> Those are some great ideas for us. Yes. Yeah, I'm gonna talk to you about that. If you guys wanna make money here, get you some t shirts yeah. going. Well anyway, uh, five years later we had the monument built, had a dedication. We had 6,000 people at our banquet at the convention center in Indianapolis. Success. OK. Our next was to get Captain McVeigh exonerated. Boy, that was something. I don't know how many trips we made to Washington, DC, walked those halls of justice, begged, pleaded. And finally, finally, we got Captain McVeigh exonerated. Excited about that. <clears throat> The book issue. You know, there's about, in harm's way, there's about 12 books written about this story. And this book here is probably one of the best ones. However, I want to show you what the last paragraph in this book says. 
Tammy, read it. Five percent of the author's share of royalties from hardcover sales of In Harm's Way will be donated to the USS Indianapolis Survivors Fund. Now, do you know how much we got? Zilch. Nothing. In the next printing, that paragraph is gone. So we saw him, and um, Paul said, uh, Doug, when are you going to give the survivors 5%? And he said, oh, Paul, that was a mistake. It shouldn't have been in the book. So then I said to the guys, I said, okay, it's time you write your own book. I said, you send me your stories, and we'll find a printer, and we'll get your own book started. And so... That's the story of this book. It has 317 chapters, one chapter for every survivor. Now about 200 of the men were deceased when I put this book together. But at least they have a little, about a half a page, their name, uh, what they did on the ship and so forth. At least they're recognized in this book. So after I did that book, many of the Lost at Sea family said, that is so beautiful, can you do something for us? This is a little softback I did just for them, Lost at Sea, but not forgotten. And fun, some of the stories in here are just cute as all get out. One of my favorites was, uh, there was four sisters and they had a brother and he died in the water. But when he was 16 years old, he went out on his first date. They hid two of the little sisters in the trunk of the car. And so he went and picked up his date. And so after he got the date in the car, pretty soon he heard noise in the car. Stopped the car, opened it up, and there were his two little sisters. So those are kind of the stories in there. But getting back to this um, book, I brought two of these books today because one book has 15 autographs is that that one there if someone will donate one hundred dollars to this museum you get this book with 15 autographs of survivors this book is on one autograph it's paul's autograph you donate thirty dollars to this museum today you get this book this one even has earl riggins kids Indianapolis area. Yeah. Now, the other business in Broomfield that we did thousands of dollars with was the boss print over here. Every reunion updated <coughs> this book for the survivors. It listed their addresses, phone numbers. There's one list of just deceased survivors. It also listed the divisions they were in. It also lists the last sailing list. This was not for sale. It was just my love for the survivors that I would do this book. But my point is, the business we did with the boss printing right over here. And then, this was our letter. And there's quite a story behind this. You notice it's blue and the envelopes. We would order 5,000 envelopes at a time from boss printing. But the story why we picked blue is the blue represented the blue water the men were in for five days. And it represents the blue sky that they looked up to to pray for rescue. And I, um, I think that's all I can. Well, we're still waiting for the presidential union citation, and we're hoping that President Trump will get that through um, week. We were in a city park in Denver with our Girl Scout troop and President Bush was there. And Lauren and I had a sign, and as he walked by, I yelled at him, President Bush, will you please give the unit citation to the USS Indianapolis? And he stopped, and he turned around and he said, what did you say? And I told him again and showed him our poster, and he said, I'll look into it. Well, about a month later, 9-11 happened, and we all know that a lot of people are writing to President Trump hoping it'll be uh, there's only 18 survivors left but they deserve the presidential unit citation. Well maybe we can also add our voice to that right. as well. That would be neat. 
Okay, and one other uh, thing, through this time that I was secretary and Paul chairman, we had a mailing list of about a thousand people. We sent that mailing list out twice a year. And thanks to Tammy and Lauren, they put stamps on each uh, envelope and they folded our newsletter and stuck it in each. And so they uh, have really grown up with this organization. So anyway, um, I hope I didn't bore you with this, but it's just some stuff that's uh, related to the Indianapolis, but doesn't compare to the story of this man and the other 1,197 men. So wish you all a Merry Christmas. Well, well, thank you, Mary Lou, and thank you again for your family for joining us in everything you've done for the survivors organization. Uh, we will have a reception. Let me just give a quick rundown of all the other things that the USS Indianapolis did for you. And then afterwards, we'll show the video uh, of its discovery. Let me s hopefully this will work right here. Uh, just in a quick, quick nutshell. You know, the USS Indianapolis was only one of two cr heavy cruisers built what we call the Portland class. Generally what happened is Congress would appropriate a certain amount of money, the Navy would say, let's build X number of ships, and it'll all be a similar design, so it'd be a little cheaper to do. Uh, the USS Portland and the USS Indianapolis were the only two built to a certain specification. They were built by private contractors versus the uh, normal Navy shipyards. Uh, looking at it, again, about 610 feet long, 68 feet in beam. A uh, little longer than the previous class because the previous class also suffered problems with stability and uh, also was very lightly armored. So this particular class they kind of learned from, they upped the armor a little bit. Uh, mainly though, just along kind of the you know, area around your machinery here uh, and along the water line. Uh, could travel at a max speed of 33 knots uh, and actually set a, set a record that still stands today when it carried the atomic bomb components from San Francisco to, to uh, Hawaii. On the average, they did 33 miles an hour for the whole stretch and it's never been beaten by a surface uh, craft here. Again, the armament, they had eight inch guns, two forward here uh, in groups of three, and one Babette in the back with a group of three, eight inch mounts. And when we see the discovery of the wreckage of it, they actually, you'll see where these mounts were. Uh, interestingly, they also carried uh, up to four uh, float planes, which were used for supposedly early on to help uh, scout around before, this was before radar, and then similarly when you engage, uh, you know, sh other ships at long distances, these planes actually floated around and supposedly helped you adjust uh, your fire. Now, the interesting thing is we learned very clearly, very early in the war, that these were more of a liability than, a, than an asset. Uh, anytime you have planes, and particularly this style here, uh, you on the Indianapolis, they were stored right in the middle, right in that area. It's like a little hangar where you kind of <laughs> broke them apart. Well, the problem is wherever you have planes like this, you also have fuel, gasoline. You have, uh, in many cases, lacquer because the earlier planes kind of had cloth. Things, you had oil, you had ammunition. And none of that area is armored. <laughs> And the first early battles we had in the Solomon Islands with the cruisers, the Northampton class, very similar. What happened is very early in the battle, uh, they would take a hit somewhere in that area. And that whole area would light up like a Roman candle. So the first battle of Savo Island, three of our cruisers there, all that area was set afire right off the bat. So our cruisers were rolling around the dark uh, with the massive fire right there. A and it was just, you know, a perfect target. And so even though early on uh, the Indianapolis deployed with float planes, 
uh, as you got into the war and we had improved radar, we had long distance scouts and PBYs and all that, uh, they generally didn't even use them. And it actually was in this area where the atomic bomb components were uh, carried uh, when, we, when we came out. Uh, just a couple of interesting things. Uh, as I pointed out, uh, there were the, the Portland and the Indianapolis were the only two cruisers built to that particular design. Uh, we learned things very quickly as you got into it. So each new class uh, had improvements from a previous one. The Portland class and heavy cruisers were always designed with extra accommodations because they were to serve as kind of the fleet admiral's ship. So you still needed, you know, room for the captain of the ship, but then you needed it for the fleet admiral and his staff. So they always had this extra accommodations. And the Indianapolis became a, a favorite of President Roosevelt's. During the pre-war period, on four different trips, the Indianapolis and the crew took President Roosevelt on trips, either up toward Maine. Uh, he did a kind of a courtesy trip down into South America uh, and even crossed the equator, which meant he had to, President Roosevelt had to go through the normal tradition of crossing the equator and all the kind of rigmarole that went along with it. Uh, whoops, going back. Orig whoops. Uh, I didn't realize that either, but early cruisers from the 1920s on were designed with torpedo tubes built into it. You normally think of those with destroyers. But it became very evident early on that the cruisers will never close close enough to an enemy to ever fire them. So when they finally built it, they took them out. Uh, and uh, Indianapolis was very much involved in some of the major battles and uh, invasions that went on during the war. And of course, the last one, which we, we've heard, you couldn't tell it even better. Uh, where was it? On December 7th, fortunately, uh, uh, the Indianapolis and some other ships were not at Pearl. They actually were cruising around Johnston Atoll uh, doing kind of a practice bombardment type effort. Well, as soon as Pearl Harbor came, uh, they and, and other ships were sent off to try and find the uh, Japanese fleet. Whoops, oh, yep, yep, let me go back. Ah, the Japanese fleet. And be truthful, they were lucky they didn't. If they had stumbled upon, upon the Japanese fleet, they would have been totally wiped out because you had six carriers with all the aircraft and everything who were just raring to go. Uh, in 42, they joined the Task Force 11 uh, and ended up being involved in the New Guinea campaign. This was the beginning of MacArthur's drive up through New Guinea uh, and trying to forestall the Japanese who were bringing a land force across to attack Port Moresby. So fortunately, they were there and other and basically disrupted that whole effort by the Japanese. Well, in May, we had the Battle of Midway. And in preparation for that, the Japanese invaded uh, Attu and Kisco, right on the tip of the you know, Alaskan Peninsula, in an effort to kind of draw our forces up there. Uh, well, the Indianapolis became part of the naval task force that eventually went up there and you know, suppressed them being able to reinforce it at all, and then eventually support our troops who retook the islands. 43, early in about half of the year, uh, they continued the battles up at along the Aleutian Islands to recapture Attu and Kis Kiska, uh, and then came back to Mare Island in California. What you end up seeing is many of the heavier ships would serve for a while out in the Pacific, then come back to Mare Island, because we'd, we found very early on they had inadequate anti-aircraft support. So you put a lot more anti-aircraft guns on it. As newer radars came available, you put them onto it. So periodically, everyone shuffled back to get upgrades. Uh, but then we, they took part in a major drive through the Central Pacific under Admiral Nimitz. And the first group of islands they went after there was in the Gilberts. And that was the terrible Battle of Tarawa. 
uh, they were involved in the major bombardment group to kind of <coughs> prep for that particular battle. 44 was probably their busiest year. Again, pretty much our whole Pacific operations had, had picked up. You know, we had new aircraft carriers, we had new battleships, you know, we had the major drive through the Central Pacific, and they were part of that. Uh, the next group along the way from, you know, uh, Tarawa and the Gilbert Islands uh, were the Caroline Islands and Kwajalein. And one of our residents here, uh, John Greaves, was a young Marine who participated in the capture of Kwajalein and Roy Namor. Uh, so he was there. From there, it kind of shifted onto the Caroline Islands. Let's see if we're right down along through here. Uh, then up to the Marianas uh, for the Battle of Saipan, and they were part of the Battle of the Philippine Sea. Uh, you've all heard probably about the Marianas turkey shoot, uh, and that was essentially the final decimation of uh, Japanese naval air power, and that was off of Saipan. Uh, which is also called the Battle of the Philippine Sea. And then ultimately, they went down to Palau in the Admiralty Islands. And again, part of our drive up, coming up through here toward Iwo Jima and Okinawa. And then finally, uh, in 45, what's interesting is they joined Mark Mishner's Fast Task Force. This was a group of carriers, uh, cruisers and stuff, which made a dash right up along the Japanese coast. Uh, something I never really know. They kind of went straight on out toward Tokyo and up along the coast and just plastered everything they could find. And then immediately withdrew before the Japanese could readily respond. And part of that was a preparation for the real effort here, which was the invasion of Iwo Jima uh, to follow. And the Indianapolis was part of that. They did part of the pre-bombardment for Iwo Jima and then shifted on to Okinawa. And that's when on the 31st of March, uh, ok they were hit by a kamikaze plane. Actually, it was a near miss, but the bomb kind of right down through the center part afterwards uh, and, and messed up two of the uh, propeller shafts in the engine room and just kind of created a lot of havoc on it. And that's what set the stage for them to come all the way back across the Pacific to Mare Island again, where then they were configured up for the secret mission of bringing the atomic bomb components. Uh, again, they departed San Francisco on the 16th, arrived in uh, Tinian on the 28th. And again, as we heard, the 30th was you know, the terrible tragedy for them. So anyway. That was kind of the history. And again, Paul and, and Mary Lou and, and just everything you've done to help, you know, c capture the history, you know, and everything for the Indianapolis and, and the crew is just marvelous. So anyway, uh, what we'd like to do now is hopefully you'll join us. We're going to adjourn to our library. Not everyone's probably going to fit in. But anyway, let's cut the cake up. Let's enjoy some cake and stuff. And then I'll play the video which shows, talks about the discovery. And if you can stick around for that, would like to see it, please do. Uh, if not, we'll just continue to show it during the day and other times.